I'd like to uh, thank uh, John for having me up here and the uh, rest of the organizers. It's always a pleasure to come here. I'm going to talk to you a, a bit about um, a Valiant to Mona Lisa uh, graft, uh, which is a graft that's currently in uh, clinical trials uh, in the United States, actually. So it's uh, completed its uh, first in man trial and is currently in a uh, early feasibility trial. Uh, that early feasibility trial is about halfway done, uh, and it's just had a uh, extension put into the FDA to include more sites and to include more patients, which is uh, quite nice because I've finished my enrollment. Uh, this is the uh, main device overview, so we're actually going to start at the left subclavian, and the other speaker is going to take you all the way up and around the valve. Uh, this is the actual device here uh, that you can see. It's got a main stent graft with a single branch graft uh, on it. Uh, this was really designed to sort of see how this uh, design uh, incorporates up into the arch, and the main plan for this is really to sort of move it uh, up, into the, uh, up into the arch and into the anominate, and that uh, currently is being done uh, in animal trials. Uh, this is the main graft here. You can see it's got uh, four markers uh, up at the top for uh, rate, uh, for visualization and actually uh, aligning the stent graft uh, up in the arch. The diameter is mainly uh, meant for uh, for aneurysms. It's currently uh, trying to get uh, uh, enrollment for chronic dissections as well through the FDA, but the diameters you can see here are between 30 to 46. So a younger patient for transection, it might be a bit too big. The main branch graft itself is always uh, 15 centimeters. Uh, the key to the graft here is actually this area right here, uh, which is called the uh, volcano, if you will. Uh, you can see it over here as well if you're over on this screen. Uh, the key to this is not really for it to pop up into the vessel, but uh, there's really not much metal in this area at all. It's really meant to be very flexible so that you have some leeway in how you have to align the stent graft up into whatever vessel you're trying to align it to. So it can actually be about 30 degrees off either uh, too far forward, too far back, or anterior, posterior to the vessel that it's trying to go in. And it should accommodate that movement in the arch because there is so much. This is the branch graft itself. So again, it's uh, it's really not a stent. It's actually a helical uh, uh, wire uh, that makes it very flexible. It's got a lot of radial force uh, as well. Comes in three diameters, 10, 12, and 14. The, the length is 40. One question that I always get is, is 40 millimeters uh, long enough? It actually is. If you take a look at uh, the M2S database for, uh, for thoracic aortic disease, we actually took a look at the measurement of the distance of the vertebral coming off, and the majority of those came off. Uh, right about 45 or 46 millimeters. So when you put this in, you bring it a little bit into the arch, it's, it's actually long enough. We've really not had anyone excluded because the vertebral was coming off uh, too short. <clears throat> This is how it's actually uh, delivered here. So it's a two-wire system. Uh, there are a couple things that we've sort of changed in the clinical trial uh, to try to avoid uh, all these wires up in the arch. And if you do all those uh, manipulations up in the arch, I think that your risk of stroke is uh, somewhat increased. So most of the time, we don't do any of the snaring of that second wire in the arch. We will actually bring the uh, uh, second wire from a brachial approach, come all the way down the descending aorta, or even in the iliac, snare the wire down there, then put our main wire up and then we can go up with the two wire uh, system. When you get that, one of the things that can happen is you can get wire wrap up in the arch, but that's actually very easily uh, recognized in the arch and you usually just have to rotate the device uh, probably about one or two turns counterclockwise, that unwraps the wire, and then usually just pulling on that wire uh, sort of aligns the graph. So it's really not that technically challenging with the two wires. I hate to say that, but it, it's a fairly straightforward case uh, with that through and through wire. Here you can see uh, this is uh, should be a movie, and they told me it's just going to take a little bit of time for it to uh, to play. So they told me to be patient. But again, some of the keys here that you can see is you can see there's a very nice uh, separation of the uh, main graft and that wire. And once you have that separation, you really know that your alignment is good, and you don't have to do much more than that. We will typically get these into a steep LAO, and then we will also take a view right down the uh, right down the uh, main trunk of the uh, arch. So that's typically an R with a little bit of uh, caudal direction so we can see that secondary wire going straight up in the left subclavian. 
With this device also, we will tend to keep it uh, distal to the left subclavian, and as we deploy it and pull on that wire, the device will slowly move over because it's, it's captured in the tip, and it actually aligns itself very nicely. The distance that you have to have between the left crud and the left subclavian or whatever vessel you're going to use is, is actually one centimeter. You can probably sneak it in if it's a little less than one centimeter, let's say eight or nine, by really pulling on the wire and pulling that uh, volcano distal uh, to the uh, to the branch that you're trying to get into. And again, you can see here, nice alignment. Uh, this one here, it, this is actually very nice alignment because the volcano actually will pop up uh, a little bit. People like it, it looks nice, but again, not necessary to do. Here you can see this is again the movie. This will be the main branch graft that's going to be coming up uh, through the arch and you can see here. Now one of the nice things about this for people who really want to see it pop up is when you bring this, when you bring this uh, device up, uh, it actually sort of moves that volcano up a little bit more. We typically will shoot a retrograde to see where that vertebral is. And then with this device, because it has a lot of radial force, it has a tendency to want to jump. And there are a few issues with this current device uh, for the branch uh, that you'll see and I'll talk to you a little bit about. About. But again, very slow deployment. You want these distal markers here to actually be below that uh, base of that uh, ring. Uh, the one thing about this is it's sort of on the same delivery system as any um, limb on a Medtronic uh, component. So you can see that that nose cone of that branch graft is quite long and it has a tendency to go way out in the left subclavian. It actually tracks very nicely, uh, but it, 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 if your sheath is up there shooting the retrograde, you've got to make sure that you pull that uh, sheath back so that uh, you don't sort of push it out of the arm. Uh, can you forward the uh, slide? And then here you can see the uh, completion angiogram that you're taking a look at uh, here. So we've got very nice deployment. Uh, this is actually one of the first patients that we actually treated. Uh, you can see we've got uh, uh, good fixation, good apposition up to the anomate. Uh, the stent itself is aligned very nicely to the uh, left carotid. Uh, you can see there's good filling to the uh, to the left subclavian as well. You can't see it sort of got cut out in the picture, but the vertebral fills uh, nicely as well. Uh, this patient actually had an aneurysm extended all the way down to the celiac. So we then had to bring that uh, down uh, to the ciliac. Oftentimes, if I have a large thoracoabdominal with this stent graft, I will typically build from the bottom up, uh, and that allows me with the second piece not having to go up and sort of hit uh, the branch graft that's, uh, that's up there. Uh, one of the other investigators actually, however, will actually deploy all his secondary pieces on the through and through wire, and he'll bring that up with the nose cone actually going into the left subclavian uh, and then extending it all the way down, and that actually seems to work out uh, uh, fairly nicely. We've had actually follow-up on the first in man all the way out to uh, three years, and the follow-up has actually been very good. Uh, we have had a couple people expire in the first of man uh, trials uh, from their secondary diseases, uh, two of which were both uh, severe COPD, uh, but that was about uh, two years afterwards. Uh, here you can see the nice alignment of the stent craft. You can see that left subclavian sort of comes off uh, posteriorly. We didn't have any of the branches uh, become uh, occluded uh, over the uh, uh, study uh, period. Uh, and we had no fractures or dislocations of that uh, comp of those two component uh, pieces there, and you can see the aneurysm there shrunk uh, quite nicely uh, and and thrombosed off uh, with no evidence of uh, any endo leak. Here again, you can see just the sequential 3D CTAs. Uh, this is that same patient at one month. Here you can see it at uh, six months. Uh, really hasn't had any movement uh, at all. Uh, you can see all the uh, arch vessels really uh, look uh, quite nicely. Uh, the stent is uh, well incorporated. And then you can see here at uh, one year, aneurysm remains thrombosed, no fractures or dislocations uh, up in that uh, more proximal area. This is, a, again, just that same patient with the sequential overlay and then the one-year spin, so you'll see it sort of rotate all the way around. Now, the one thing about this uh, uh, patient here, you may see it on the distal end, on that 3D, is she actually dilated up on that uh, distal segment down by the celiac, uh, and then I had to extend uh, down to the SMA uh, with a 
uh, uh, preserving the celiac uh, by uh, endovascular means, uh, but she did dilate up on that discipline, and we did have to uh, fix that. But it had nothing to do with the uh, with the top end. It's really more progression of uh, of disease. Again, here you can see some of the uh, results of the one year outcomes of these patients. Again, patient over there on the left. Uh, this one here uh, on the uh, right uh, with a large PAU. You can actually see it up by the left of Clavin uh, with a good uh, a good exclusion of that uh, large PAU. These are the baseline demographics and the clinical characteristics of the first in man trial. Uh, there was actually another patient in this trial but was on an emergency use, so there were actually a total of uh, 10 patients. Um, uh, uh, so there were eight in the U.S. and then two in the U.K., but for the trial itself and publication, we only included the nine that was, were meant to be in the uh, trial. Mean age of the patients was uh, 73. What's very interesting about this trial amongst uh, sort of all aneurysm trials is you see that preponderance of patients were actually females, and this actually extends into the um, uh, feasibility trial where, again, the majority of patients, nearly 70 percent, uh, uh, tend to be uh, women. You can see here that the uh, majority of the uh, aneurysms were saccular. There were four fusiform. Uh, you can see the comorbidities, just like uh, most patients with this disease process, a high risk of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, and arrhythmias. Uh, mean maximum aneurysm diameter was 53.7 millimeters. Remember, there were a number of uh, uh, penetrating aortic ulcers that were also included uh, in this trial. Mean left subclavian artery uh, diameter, uh, osseum 10.3, the distally was 9.6. So you, again, you can see see the graph sizes uh, fit quite nicely. We didn't have anyone excluded from the trial uh, for too small of a uh, left subclavian. Overall, we had a 100% uh, successful delivery and deployment of the main stent crafts as well as the branch crafts. Uh, duration of the procedure, you can see here, actually wasn't that long. It was only about uh, um, 125 minutes. Uh, we did use general anesthesia uh, in all the cases. I'm not sure it's necessarily necessary. Uh, I tend to like general anesthesia for the cases. Uh, you can also do it uh, totally percutaneously. Uh, I did that in two. Uh, access uh, typically was from the brachial. Uh, the two cases that were done in London was uh, performed from an uh, axillary cut down. I'm not exactly sure why that was done, but uh, that's, uh, that's what they do there. Uh, and then seven patients had a fairly extensive disease, which required extension uh, down distally down to the um, ciliac. Overall hospital stay for the patients, some of these patients because of the device delivery system, them. The fact that they were women did require a uh, conduit, uh, and that tended to increase their overall uh, length of stay. Again, uh, primary endpoints, overall technical success was 100%. Composite safety endpoints throughout one year. All cause mortality, uh, there were no deaths in the uh, study. Uh, aneurysm related mortality was zero. Uh, there was uh, uh, three patients that uh, had uh, stroke, and it's important to sort of take a look at this uh, definition of stroke that we looked at the trial. So we wanted to sort of really define stroke uh, very closely because we were somewhat uh, concerned that uh, this wire manipulation may actually occur. Uh, so when we did this, all these patients were actually evaluated preoperatively by an independent neurologist, very similar to like the CREST trial. Uh, they underwent a, a, st a stroke scale, evaluated them both pre- and post-procedure. In the United States, we only had one uh, stroke. Uh, the the uh, procedures that were done in London, the two um, had a stroke uh, in both of the patients. But again, when you define these strokes, these were minor, non-disabling uh, neurologic uh, uh, events. Uh, my first, uh, I actually had the one stroke in the United States. It took them actually about five days uh, to determine that the patient actually had a stroke, and it was a posterior circulation, and he had a little bit of loss of the visual field defect uh, out in the uh, out on the uh, uh, left eye, and that um, that was considered a stroke. Uh, but otherwise, the patient uh, did well, uh, was living at home independently without any issues. Uh, paraplegia: we didn't have any patients uh, who developed any paraplegia, and we had no patients with left arm or hand ischemia. <clears throat> Uh, other secondary endpoints uh, include uh, other secondary endovascular procedures. At one year, there were none. I did talk to you about the one patient that I uh, extended on the distal end, but that was actually about three years post-procedure. We had no patients converted to open surgical repair. Uh, no patients required surgical revascularization of the uh, left subclavian, and none of the patients have uh, ruptured. 
So overall, we've had 100% stent graft uh, integrity and patency. Uh, there's been no kinking, twisting, separation, or migration, fracture, or occlusion of the main or uh, branch stent grafts. Uh, we did have uh, one endo leak at 12 months. Uh, one was a type 2. Uh, one was a type 3. The type 3 was very small. Uh, that was also one of my patients. The aneurysm was not getting bigger, and I elected to leave that uh, alone and watch it as she uh, continues to do well. So in conclusion, uh, the Valiant uh, Mona Lisa stent graft system has performed as planned through uh, one year follow-up. Patients will be continue to be followed uh, through five years, and we have had extension of this uh, uh, device um, in the uh, early feasibility trial. Uh, that 11 patients uh, has actually been increased uh, to, I think it's about 19 patients uh, to date, and all of those patients are actually doing quite well. Thank you.